Well, the sermon text is Luke chapter 19, verses 1 to 10, uh, Luke 19, 1 to 10, but I'm just going to read briefly uh, from Ezekiel chapter 34, verses 25 to 31. So Ezekiel 34 from verse 25, and then Luke chapter 19, 1 to 10. I will make with them a covenant of peace and banish wild beasts from the land so that they may dwell securely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. And I will make them and the places all around my hill a blessing. And I will send down the showers in their season. They shall be showers of blessing. And the trees of the field shall yield their fruit, and the earth shall, shall yield its increase, and they shall be secure in their land. And they shall know that I am the Lord, when I break the bars of their yoke and deliver them from the hand of those who enslaved them. They shall no more be a prey to the nations, nor shall the beasts of the land devour them. They shall dwell securely, and none shall make them afraid. And I will provide for them renowned plantations, so that they shall no more be consumed with hunger in the land, and no longer suffer the reproach of the nations. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God with them, and that they, the house of Israel, are my people, declares the Lord. And you are my sheep, human sheep of my pasture, and I am your God, declares the Lord God. And uh, Luke chapter 19. Luke 19, 1 to 10. And he entered Jericho and began passing through. And behold, there was a man whose name was called Zacchaeus. He was a chief toll collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was. Uh, but because of the crowd, he could not, uh, since he was small with respect to stature. So he ran on ahead and and climbed up a, a sycamore fig tree to see him, for he was about to pass by. And when Jesus came to that place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, quickly come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and joyfully received him. And when they saw it, they began grumbling. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my possessions I give to the poor. And if I have extorted anything from anyone, I restore it four times to him. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he truly is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. That's the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Uh, Father, as we come to your word once again, uh, we pray that you would help us uh, to uh, know you more rightly and to, and to worship you more deeply and more truly for what you have done in the Lord Jesus Christ, who comes to seek us, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, about 40 years ago, a woman named Lori Ogilvie found herself in a sad situation. She had just given birth to a daughter named Denise at only the age of 15 years old. And so she decided to give Denise up for adoption. Uh, Denise was adopted into a loving family and was renamed uh, Susie. When Susie grew up, she searched in vain for her mother, trying to find every possible way of reconnecting with her. And then she saw an advert for a new technology, and that technology was DNA sequencing. And she thought, just on the off chance that my mother one day decides to look for me, let me put my DNA in the, in the database. So uh, Susie went and got that done. Well, it turns out that her mother had had the same thought <coughs> six months before, and Susie was reunited with her mother, Lori. To Susie's joy, uh, she had found her mother. As it turns out, sometimes you think you're seeking somebody, but they were already seeking for you. Well, our text today is about a first century seeker named Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus is on a quest, a very important quest, a quest to find out who Jesus was. This is the most important question that one has to come to a conclusion with. So this is an important quest that Zacchaeus is on. And he's just in time, right? Because Jesus is passing through Jericho. This is his last stop on the way to Jerusalem before his passion. Uh, Jericho is a, a site rebuilt by Herod. This is not the original site of Jericho in the Old Testament. 
Uh, it is a site rebuilt uh, nearby after its uh, destruction, and so uh, it is. It is built in a valley. So it, it, the 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 way that the uh, agriculture works is that there are tons of. It's flowing with spices, fruits, balsam, and all sorts of things. So it is a, a beautiful city with amazing fragrances blowing on the wind through it. Now that that as a result, because of its position and what could grow, they made it a very wealthy trade city, which is important for our story. Now Jericho is also the scene, although it was the older Jericho, but Jericho as a name is associated with the prostitute Rahab, uh, who assisted Israeli spies in their mission to Jericho. She's included, as you might remember, in the lineage of Jesus in Matthew chapter 1, verse 5. So our question is, will Zacchaeus be another great sinner included in redemptive history? Well, Jesus is on the move through the city, and uh, Zacchaeus is there. Now, his Hebrew name means something like uh, my righteous one or my innocent one, which is quite ironic because Zacchaeus is anything but a righteous or innocent one. In fact, we read here that he is called a chief tax collector. Now, when I read this, I translated that chief toll collector. The reason is, by the time uh, we're talking about Jesus' presence here in, in Palestine, the time of publicans is over. So there aren't tax collectors collecting direct income taxes for the state at that at point in time. Rather, you have toll collectors who, uh, who issue tolls for traveling, for farms and crops, and uh, that kind of thing. Now, they had targets for what they would collect as tolls, and they would over-collect tolls on behalf of the Romans. Those excesses they kept for themselves, and so they were highly associated, these toll collectors, with dishonesty and greed. And they were all the more hated if they were a Jew, because they were seen as apostates uh, serving themselves and the foreign emperor. So being the chief toll collector, the point is, Zacchaeus is pretty much the most hated of men in the city. And he's the one who comes looking for Jesus, the worst of the worst. Now, in Luke's gospel so far, toll collectors have been pretty sympathetic to Jesus' message. So we hold out some hope for Zacchaeus. But hope starts to slide downhill when we find out that he is rich. As expected, his profession has made him very wealthy, especially since he's the chief toll collector, but he is in a wealthy trade city. So he's not only the worst of the worst, but the richest of the rich. And that's where the problem starts, because Jesus' interactions with toll collectors so far had been fine, but with the rich, it had not gone well at all. In fact, Jesus, just a few uh, chapters earlier, with the rich ruler, had said that it would be easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter heaven. In other words, it is impossible. And lastly, we learn that Zacchaeus is short. Now, this is an interesting detail because physical descriptions of people in the New Testament are very rare. So when they do occur, you want to pay careful attention. Uh, in that context, shortness is associated with a uh, lacking in somewhat of character, uh, and it, it, it's used as a, as a smart against someone. Uh, so somebody who is uh, the, the worst of the worst, the richest of the rich, the most lacking in character is this person who is looking for Jesus. Very interesting. And the last part of the setting is what Zacchaeus is up to. So have a look back at verse uh, 3. So he's seeking to see who Jesus was. Now, this is the same phrase uh, in Greek that's used throughout Luke for when somebody is trying to determine Jesus' identity. Uh, not just who is that person walking over there, but knowing that that is Jesus of Nazareth. Who is he really? Why is he here? What is he doing? And this is Zacchaeus' mission. As I said, it's an important one. But it's not long before he encountered a problem. We all know that money can't buy everything, including, despite having a mountain of cash, he can't buy his way out of the valley of physics. Uh, he is unable to see over the crowd. Now, it's true in one sense he's struggling to see over the crowd because he is short, but it's also probably worth noting that the crowd would be actively opposing him having sight of what's going on. Why does this rich guy need to see who Jesus is? 
Well, the crowd doesn't think he needs access, but, and so he can't get a front row seat, which he wanted to Jesus. So uh, he decides then to go look for a bird's eye view. So Palestine's very own uh, Danny DeVito <laughs> runs ahead of the crowd and finds a sycamore to climb up. Now, this is not a sycamore as in we use the phrase in America, like a plane tree. This is a type of fig a kind of fig tree. Uh, it's quite prolific in the, in the fruit that it bears, but its figs are an inferior quality. They're narrow and finger-like, and they're actually quite bitter. So it's called the poor man's fig at the time. Quite ironic. The richest of the rich has to climb the poorest of the poor's tree. The people of that time who are wealthy also like to be seen in fancy areas, right? We have the same today. Instagramming yourself in a cool location is kind of way of elevating your status. But here we see another pretty shocking detail in the text. Zacchaeus runs and climbs. These are childlike activities that he is performing. They're not the dignified activities of a CEO in Silicon Valley. Uh, you don't see such men in their suits running around and climbing trees. Well, that tells us something. His high status may be telling him how he should behave, or at least other people would think he would behave. But his desperation exceeds his sense of propriety, and he climbs up the tree. In other words, faith shoved him up the tree. This is the childlikeness that Jesus said, without which one cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. In verse 5, we have a narrative change-up, because we've been looking at things from Zacchaeus' perspective, but the narrator switches it now, and we, and we see uh, Jesus arriving. And something surprising happened. The first is that Jesus stops to speak to Zacchaeus. Now, I'm sure there were lots of people trying to see who Jesus was in some sense. There was a crowd following him. In fact, crowds may have gathered ahead to try and, and catch him as he entered a place. But he stops for Zacchaeus up the tree. Uh, see, as we look through the Gospels, Jesus is attracted to displays of faith. He sees someone exercising faith, and he stops, and the attention turns to them. Well, here he stops to speak to Zacchaeus. And then he looks up and he calls Zacchaeus by name. Zacchaeus didn't say, hey, Jesus, who are you? Z Jesus stops and looks up and says, Zacchaeus. He knew who his, what his name was already because Jesus was seeking Zacchaeus. So the initiative of Jesus is the focus. We all know what a great feeling it is when you meet someone and you tell them your name and then you see them a couple months later and they go, ah, oh, Kevin, great to see you. And you feel loved and that this person was able to remember your name. What if you met someone who knew your name before you even told it to them? Well, that is our Lord Jesus. What a joy and a comfort that would be uh, to a man evidently desperate for something. Well, there's a few other crucial details here. Firstly, Jesus says, uh, I must stay at your house. Now, that slightly obscures the meeting, uh, meaning of, of what he's saying there. He's saying, it is necessary that I stay at your house. And this is a phrase used throughout the gospel to indicate divine necessity. This is something that has to happen. This is part of my mission, that I stay at your house. It's used 18 times alone in Luke uh, to talk about it. Even the necessity of pre his preaching uses that phrase. The necessity of his death, he uses that phrase. It's the unstoppable advancement of the kingdom of God. That Jesus would go everywhere that it is necessary in order to fulfill his mission, even into the home of the worst of sinners. This is not a chance event. The father had called ahead and made a reservation for Jesus to have dinner with the IRS. And secondly, the word for today that he says is necessary uh, today uh, is primarily used in Luke and Acts to indicate important events like the birth and death of Christ, the beginning of his ministry, and when he forgives sins. Something big is happening right now. And so see Zacchaeus' response. Joyfully, quickly, he comes down and welcomes Jesus into his house as a guest. 
Oh, that is the right response uh, to Jesus. But now we see the wrong response to Jesus' actions. Have a look at verse 7. In great contrast to that, the crowd becomes a, an obstacle, but of a different kind. Instead of physically trying to prevent Zacchaeus uh, from seeing Jesus, now they're grumbling. I see verse 7 says, And they began to grumble, He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner, a sinner man. How could Jesus have dinner with that guy, the IRS? See, the Pharisees were scandalized that Jesus would make his home in the house of a national traitor in their eyes. He was no Robin Hood stealing from the poor and, and giving to, uh, sorry, stealing from the rich and giving to the poor. He was an equal opportunity extortionist. Everyone had been the victim of his extortion. Well, how could Jesus associate with this kind of guy? There's an important overarching biblical covenantal thing to notice that's happening with this word choice, though, because the, to, to grumble, to complain out loud, is used in the Septuagint, it's the Greek translation of the Old Testament, for the, the account that happens in Exodus 17 of the people grumbling at God in the wilderness. Uh, when they, they, they accuse him of not being a shepherd, essentially. You've led us out of the wonderful and cushy Egypt uh, to make us starve and, uh, uh, and die of, of thirst here in the desert. That's what the people were doing. They brought a lawsuit against their, their Lord. They grumbled and complained. And so what you're seeing here is Israel pictured in its grumbling against the one who has actually come to save. Uh, just as they grumbled against Yahweh in the wilderness, so they grumble against the Lord Jesus here. And they say, why would, they, why would he go into the house of a sinner man? Because they don't see themselves as sinners. Why would you go there? You could have dinner with us instead. To them, Zacchaeus is just a, a defiled outcast. And they are the sons of Abraham in their view. Right? Not that guy. We're the sons of Abraham. So Jesus' compassion for sinners, which is a recurring theme in the Gospels, and we see it throughout Luke, this is an enigma to them. And it elicits their constant contempt that the Lord would come and show mercy. But Jesus rejected the Pharisees' practice of separating from sinners, and, and they, they wanted to appear pure by dissociating from sinners. But rather than learning what Jesus is doing and finding out why he's here, they just act the judge like the bitter older brother in the tale of the prodigal son. This should remind us of what happened in chapter 5, in fact, of Luke. When Jesus has table fellowship with Levi and the others, the Pharisees and scribes grumbled, saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? To which Jesus replied, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now, this is a challenging response to the Pharisees. Jesus came for sinners. Fake religiosity of the, of the Pharisees hates seeing the grace of God face to face. The nature of the kingdom of God is that there are going to be people welcomed into it which almost scandalizes us. It certainly scandalized the Jews. But the most surprising of people will be welcomed into the kingdom of heaven, including tax collectors and sinners. See, what we can see in the Pharisees here is that people who don't know grace don't show grace. Grace is a foreign dialect to them. They don't understand that grace is actually the only power that can and must reach to the worst of people. Well, after the resistance of the crowd, Jesus' uh, sinner dinner takes an interesting turn because Zacchaeus stands up and in a solemn manner, he does three things. The first, interestingly, is he calls Jesus Lord. Earlier, Zacchaeus was seeking to see who Jesus was, verse 3. But now in faith, Jesus has, has come to be seen by Zacchaeus as more than a man, uh, even his Lord. And the second is Zacchaeus announces that he's going to give half of what he owns to the poor. So upon recognizing who Jesus is and what's going on, he is moved to be generous and to part with half of his wealth. 
Now, it's obviously true that, ge- that Christians are to be characterized by their generosity, right? We see that right throughout the New Testament. However, there's no New Testament vow of poverty or anything like that required, as if, as a gr- as if for the grant of salvation, you need to dispose of half of your assets. But the point is, it's showing the difference in Zacchaeus' heart to that of the rich ruler. You see, Jesus had said to them, to him, one thing you lack Give your possessions away, all of them, and you will, you will have treasure in the kingdom of heaven, right? Well, Zacchaeus is not trying to get a 50% deal of, uh, you know, Black Friday deal on salvation, but he's come to understand Jesus' words in chapter 12 of Luke. One's life does not consist in the abundance of one's possession. When coming faith to faith, face to face with grace, he is moved to generosity, and third, he promises to, so that, that's the, uh, the move of generosity. But the third thing is he promises to repay four times what he has extorted. So not only is he moved to be generous in light of what, what, who Jesus is, but he is moved to make restitution for what he has done wrong. And this is the same word for extortion uh, as what John the Baptist told the toll collectors to stop doing in chapter 3. Remember they said, what must we do to be saved? And he said, stop extorting people. Right? So salvation is coming to Zacchaeus. He's saying, I should not have extorted people. And I'm going to express, uh, in, in making restitution, I'm going to express my, uh, my sorrow for my sin. So uh, much has been made about the amount, the fact that he did uh, fourfold, uh, because that's kind of uh, has parity to the sheep rustling repayment requirement in Exodus 22. But I think it's best not to read too much into this. You rather want to state that Zacchaeus is demonstrating true sorrow, and he's picked a, a biblical kind of amount to do it. This is not to say that if you've done something wrong, restitution has to be fourfold. But this is just an indicator that he truly is repentant for what he has done. And now we can see in this the, the two effects of grace uh, when we repent. The first is that God's grace transforms the heart. It gives us a new lens, a new perspective on things, everything, down to our possessions. Our relationship with material things changes. And that was particularly a poignant thing in light of uh, who Zacchaeus was as a wealthy toll collector. So his generosity is a genuine evidence of his uh, new lens, of his salvation. And it, it, it is not what gives him or brings salvation for him, but rather flows from it. And second, God's, and this is, this is really important, God's grace pushes sin out into the open. It causes you to admit your sin, to take what is in darkness and put the uh, disinfecting light of Christ's work upon it. Uh, grace pushes this up out of you. Think of how your body pushes out a thorn. Uh, Grace uh, moves what's on the inside outwards so that it can be revealed, and it it is painful, right? As the thorn comes out, there's pain at the site of the wound, but the end is healing. And so Zacchaeus has admitted what is being buried in his heart, the crimes that he's committed, and he is uh, forgiven. So Zacchaeus is justified because of what he believes. He's not purchased his salvation by returning what he's stolen, but his actions are evident that he truly has repented. Well, after this announcement, after Zacchaeus has stood up and made it, uh, in verse 9, there's a pronouncement on two parts from, from Jesus. The first is he says, salvation has come to Zacchaeus' house. Now, the word for salvation here only occurs two times in Luke. The first is the Benedictus, the song of Zechariah. It emphasizes Jesus is the one who's bringing salvation. In that, in that song, it was Jesus who was going to bring salvation to Israel. And when he comes to Zacchaeus' house, when he walks through the door, he's saying, salvation just entered your house. And the second component is that he gives a basis for the salvation. You can translate this, Zacchaeus is a true son 
of Abraham. Abraham's mentioned 15 times in Luke. So it's clear that for, for Luke, Luke wants to emphasize that Jesus is coming, fulfilling God's promise to Abraham. In other words, in the case of Zacchaeus, Jesus reverses the excommunication of Zacchaeus. And I, I think we should see that Jesus here has recognized in Zacchaeus legitimate repentance. Because if you remember in chapter 3, John, John the Baptist said, Bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able to raise up from these stones children for Abraham. So this is precisely the opposite of what the crowd was doing, right? They were saying, we are the children of Abraham. And John the Baptist had said, don't say that. That's not, the, that's not the way to go. They were appealing to genetic lineage for their identity as Abraham's children. And what they should have done was repent, like Zacchaeus. And then Jesus explains this by making one of the most important statements he makes in the Gospels about his messianic identity and mission. Look at verse 10. The Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. Uh, Jesus uses the title Son of Man here so that he can define his mission on his own terms. He's not a political revolutionary. He's a suffering servant who will die a criminal's death on the cross. He will forgive sins and he will return again one day in judgment. But he is also the king exercising kingly authority, pronouncing salvation, and including Zacchaeus. So that's his identity, but what about his mission? Well, Jesus says that he came to seek and to save that which is lost. Well, we know that every single human has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and therefore every person has no hope but for the Lord Jesus. And amazingly, using the same verb to seek, as what Zacchaeus was doing back in verse 3, Jesus is saying, you were seeking me because you didn't know who I was, but I was seeking you because I did know who you are, and I have always known who you are. This recalls for us that amazing imagery that we read in the Old Testament in Ezekiel chapter 34. Remember, as, I, as a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among his sheep that they have been scattered, so will I seek out my sheep. So through these themes of seeking out and identifying and gathering his, his sheep that were lost, Jesus is identifying himself as the great shepherd of Israel, Yahweh, who's come to walk among his people. And you should think about this because he says to Zacchaeus, you or he also is a, a true child of Abraham. Now, who can confer the status of child of Abraham other than the Lord of the covenant who made it? Who can come and walk among the people and say, you are an heir of this promise that was made? Only the one who made it. And that's what he's doing right there to Zacchaeus, transferring him from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his light by his declaration. That is what happens to all of us in justification, where God pronounces us to be children of Abraham through faith. So that's what Jesus' messianic identity and mission does, that he has come as the great shepherd of Israel to seek his sheep. So what we have really is an unexpected ending. Uh, like Susie seeking Laurie in the beginning, we, we started off the story through the eyes of Zacchaeus, who thinks he's taking the initiative in seeking to see who Jesus was. But through the switch of the perspective in the story, we see that it was Jesus seeking Zacchaeus all along. And at the same time, we learn that to receive Jesus is to receive salvation. So when Jesus called Zacchaeus' name, we saw the appropriate response. An accurate appraisal of your life as a sinner can only lead you to conclude that you need salvation. 
And so when faced with the righteousness of Christ and you know who he is, you can't help but know yourself as a sinner. And it's precisely that realization coupled with repentance that led to salvation for Zacchaeus and for you and I. In fact, it was Jesus' identity and mission that meant he came seeking and saving the lost, flipping the identities of sinners. Just think about those converts of Scripture. Abraham the liar, Jacob the schemer, Ruth the Moabite, David the adulterer, Rahab the harlot, Paul the persecutor, and here Zacchaeus the chief toll collector. How comforting is that? Because Jesus came to seek in the lost, uh, to seek the save in the, uh, the lost. That means that God knows you, that God loves you, and that, that God called you by your name to become a child of Abraham. And, he, and that is before the foundation of the world. It wasn't just when Jesus arrived. This was, he always knew the name of his people. And so if you have been found, it is because Jesus was seeking you first. And if he sought after you and he found you, how much more will he keep you and preserve you by his spirit until the day when you see your shepherd and savior forever. Amen.